Welcome to TP Talks, PwC's Global Transfer Pricing Podcast Series. In today's episode, we will be discussing how the OECD Financial Transactions Transfer Pricing Discussion Draft will impact clients' transfer pricing policies. And we'll also take a look at the uncertainties there are for clients, given some of the underlying policy issues. My name is Dana Hart, and today I have several distinguished guests joining us by phone. First, I have Vout Moylens, a director in our PwC New York office. Also from our PwC New York office, I have Catherine O'Brien, a principal with our U.S. National Tax Services. Omar Muller, a director with our PwC Netherlands office. And Dan Pipus, a director in our PwC UK practice. Vout, you have graciously agreed to moderate this discussion, so I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to you. Thank you, Dana. On July 3rd, the OECD released a non-consensus discussion draft on the TP aspects of financial transactions, which included loans, cash pooling, and guarantees, among other topics. Catherine, can I ask you to help set the stage on some of the important areas the draft addresses? Sure. Thanks, Bout. Guidance in this area is badly needed. The lack of consensus among tax authorities or even within a country in uh, the application of principles for inbound versus outbound transactions have put taxpayers in a difficult position. That being said, the current draft, which was more than seven years in the making, acknowledging that this is a non-consensus document, it screams further controversy. As a result, clients should reevaluate their financial transactions, policies, documentation, in light of the discussion draft, if for no other reason than for risk assessment purposes. Now, the draft addresses the importance of looking at a transaction from both parties' perspectives. It recommends a thorough functions, assets, and risk analysis and consideration of realistic alternatives to the transaction. It further suggests that the tax authorities consider conditions that independent parties would have agreed to in comparable circumstances. I do want to note, when I was at GE, we reviewed what conditions independent parties would require in a loan agreement and found everything and nothing in a third-party context. So I think that's just a red herring. Um, With respect to loans in particular, the draft takes a top-down approach and embraces implicit support. It concedes, however, that a standalone approach may be appropriate where an entity is of no strategic value or importance. On treasury functions, the draft assumes a treasury function is a support service. At the draft, um, that there's a presumption that a cash pool leader is a service provider, and there is a call for better understanding regarding efficiencies resulting from the use of a cash pool and who ultimately is the beneficiary of a cash pool, whether it's the m group, pool participants, or maybe just the parent. And it raises the issue of how synergies should be accounted for, kind of a recurring theme in the OECD guidance lately. With respect to to guarantees, the draft reflects a clear, in my opinion, misunderstanding on when and why third parties request guarantees uh, by an affiliate of a borrower. The draft discusses several pricing approaches but fails to acknowledge that a guarantee is required in many instances in order to obtain a loan, not because the borrower is undercapitalized, but due to risk constraints at the lender. The draft basically suggests that a borrower should not be worse off in paying for a guarantee uh, when considering the borrowing costs versus the use of a guarantee. I think that summarizes some of the provisions. Thank you, Catherine. Going back to the point that it's a non-consensus discussion draft, uh, Dan, can you speak to um, the views of the other OECD countries may have that may have influenced the draft uh, and what issues may be, may be gray areas that our clients should be aware of? Thanks, Val. It's a good question. I think there's a few particular gray areas which we can look back on, and I think it's quite clear that this is where some of the tax authorities have really struggled to reach consensus. The first one of these relates to the delineation of the transaction. Um, so, is it based, firstly, is this, is this appropriate in an intercompany financing situation? And also, how important is decision-making in that context? And what particular people substance is required to make decisions, both on a lender and borrower perspective? Um, The the second point relates to the risk-free and risk-adjusted returns. Um, Because again, back in 
2014, we had the BEPS draft, the, the Actions 8 to 10 paper. And within that, it talked about the risk-free and risk-adjusted returns, but didn't give a lot of insight as to how to actually go about calculating those. And so when we look at the risk-free return, for example, this paper gives us some more insights, but it's clear, particularly in the complexity of the way in which they've talked about risk-free return in this paper, that this is going to need some further thought uh, in order to reach consensus between the various tax authorities. I think the third area, which is another gray area, which probably will need to be considered in a bit more depth, is this could and would considerations. And this kind of guidance has been in, in place in the UK for some time in our thin capitalization guidance, but I think for a lot of other territories, this is quite new. And often they've relied on the legal form of the transaction and questioned less the, the kind of could and would argument as to what options realistically available are there for the lender and borrower, and therefore what would they have done at arm's length. And so these three elements, I think, form the foundation of what I would call the grey areas. I think when we look then to, well, who have been the main contributors to the, the actual discussion draft, you can see um, some elements of the Australian uh, authorities having some influence given the Chevron case and some of the particular legal terms and inferences from that, um, particularly in the delineation of risk section. Um, you can see the UK's influence, as I mentioned, um, particularly around the thing capitalization and could and would arguments, but also in other areas such as the cash pooling section, which is a lot of that reflects the cash pooling guidance released by HMRC last year. And then finally, the point of sales piece in the captive insurance section refers quite heavily or links quite heavily to some case law we had in the UK a number of years ago. I think one of the areas where potentially one of the territories has pushed back more so than, than other areas has been probably the US. And that links quite a lot to the, the association of funding return with risk. And clearly in this paper, this is moving towards more the economic substance rather than the legal form and funding of the transaction. I think for the US in particular and some of the other larger territories where they've relied on that legal form in the past, this will be a big shift for them, in particular in trying to reach consensus in this discussion draft. Thanks, Dan, for your insights. The next question then would be, um, after we've discussed the, so the key concepts of the discussion draft, is how this would reconcile with uh, domestic legislation around intercompany financial transactions in their respective territories. Ketrin, uh, given that the U.S. has recently enacted tax reform and that there definitely will be implications for, for intercompany borrowings as a result of that, what are your views on how this will impact uh, domestic U.S. legislation, if at all? Well, Val, I mean, I think the, the U.S. tax reform included legislation that imposed a limitation on interest expense. 163J as amended limits the deduction of business interest expense to the sum of the business interest income for the taxable year plus 30% of the taxpayer's adjusted taxable income with some limitations. The limitation applies to both related and unrelated party debt, and the interest can be carried over kind of indefinitely. The U.S. legislation, however, does not change the U.S.'s rules regarding the determination of an arm's length price regarding interest on a loan that's still governed by Treasury Regs 1.482-2, nor does it modify the U.S. principles regarding whether a loan is appropriately characterized as debt or equity. And at least the OECD uh, draft guidance um, specifically provides that it, it, quote, is not intended to prevent countries from implementing approaches to address capital structure and interest deductibility on, under domestic legislation. So I think, and I guess the point of uh, contention among the working group on the OECD guidance is this debt versus equity issue, and uh, that remains to be seen, whether they land on some guidance that conflicts with U.S. principles on debt versus equity. Thank you, Catherine. Omar, why don't you discuss the perspective from um, the other side of the pond, from a European point of view and, and from a from a Dutch point of view in particular. Are the tax authorities that are ready to adopt these new, new guidelines or do you think that substantial changes need to occur? Yes, thank you, Wout. So the Dutch tax authorities are actually well developed in the area of financial transactions, especially the transfer pricing team. But the Netherlands already introduced formal guidance in relation to, for instance, intercompany loans and guarantees 
in its 2013 update of the transfer pricing decree. And also included uh, language on implicit support adjustments that are to be performed, including the interplay with the strategic importance of, of group subsidiaries. But also, for instance, on the appropriate characterization of an intercompany transaction, specifically in relation to intercompany loans and guarantees. So in its core, the guidance provided in the discussion draft that the OCD has put out has a lot of resemblances with the guidance that we have already present in the Netherlands transfer pricing decree and the overall and what we see in common in the Dutch transfer pricing practice. For instance, in, in audits, we frequently experience that the Dutch tax authorities challenge the arm's length nature of financing transactions from various angles, uh, including the arm's length nature of terms and conditions applied, the arm's length nature of the principal amount of a loan, but also requiring an assessment of implicit support adjustments, uh, trying to recharacterize cash pool transactions from short-term financing into a long-term financing arrangement, or challenging the lack of a reallocation mechanism for in relation to any cash pool advantage to, for instance, uh, entities that have cash on deposit within a cash pool. Now, all these elements we clearly see reflected in the current draft that the OECD has put out. More broadly speaking, over the years, I think we have witnessed that tax authorities across Europe have increased their knowledge and understanding in the area of transfer pricing, specifically for financial transactions. This ranges from, from the Nordics, quite some, let's say, public court cases in the area of cash pool structures, all the way to the south of Europe, uh, specifically thinking of Spain and Italy, which are very active in this area of transfer pricing. And I think the increasing number of court cases involving disputes around the tax and transfer pricing aspects of financial transactions evidences this trend. And now that the OECD has released this initial discussion draft, you now with more detailed guidance on how to approach financial transactions from a transfer pricing point of view, we expect that this trend will only increase in the near future. Also, when we think how this is linked to, for instance, the, say, the transparency or the documentation requirements resulting from the master file and local file transfer pricing documentation template that is being implemented more and more and applied more and more in, in the European member states, which also requires taxpayers to disclose their transfer pricing policies in relation to their financial transactions. Thanks, Omar. Then, in terms of any actions our clients should be thinking of taking now, do you have any suggested actions they should be taking, if any? Sure, yeah, thank you, Val. I think there's, there's a few, um, and it's difficult, of course, because this is still non-consensus paper, but there's some messages and some learnings, I think, from this, which ultimately what might be nuanced in the final version we still think they will hold quite a lot of their current form, and so therefore it's worth considering now. The first of these relates to the intercompany agreements. So one of the key points from the discussion draft is the construct of intercompany lending agreements and whether or not they need to be accurately delineated based on the functionality of the two parties, but also based on the terms and conditions within those agreements. And so a key step for now is to consider, well, what would a borrower and a lender have entered into at arm's length? And consider things like the optionality built in from a borrower's perspective, and is that something they would want within the agreement or expect? And equally, is it something they would be willing to pay for? And within all of this, it's very important to consider what ramifications, things like the inclusion of collateral or security or guarantees might do if you include them in intercompany agreements, and what communications or discussions might therefore need to be had with, say, external lenders who may be also relying on similar collateral or guarantees within the group. So that's number one. I think number two relates to the economically significant risks associated with the transaction. And what this really is getting at is setting up a framework or governance setup within the group, which ensures that if you're going to enter into intercompany financing arrangements, this isn't simply a, a question of a legal documentation exercise. There has to be a process in place in order to ensure that the lender and the borrower are considering the risks associated with the transaction and but documenting this in such a way that if it were ever required to be evidenced to a tax authority, that you have that in a readily available form. Um, now, this is, again, something which goes beyond what 
I think most clients might have typically retained in the past, but it's something which will be fundamental if the discussion draft remains in a similar form because it's this decision-making ability which is very important in terms of justifying the borrower deduction and also the income in the lender territory. And then lastly, I think there's a key point here about ensuring consistency across the group. So to the extent that you or clients don't currently have a centralized financial transaction transfer pricing policy, it's important to ensure that there is some degree of centralization or normality within the group in terms of things like how do we approach credit rating and as Catherine said earlier the, the building of implicit support into that or how do we go about doing our loan benchmarking um, and all of these different elements to ensure that there is an inconsistency which different tax authorities could point to as factors to take into account when challenging a particular territory's transfer pricing setup. So overall, I suppose the takeaway message is setting up this central framework or central policy document is going to be a key step. And within that, if you can build in a governance framework and if you can consider from a legal point of view, how do we set up a construct to make sure we have the most appropriate terms from a borrower and lender perspective, then it should put you in good shape regardless of how the final draft might look. Thank you, Dan, for your insights. Catherine, to close us out, can you give an overview of what to expect from the OECD on this paper next? Um, and then in particular, if uh, in your view, clients should indeed already take action, even though this is just a, a discussion draft at the moment. Thanks, Bout. Yes, the OECD has requested that comments on the discussion draft be submitted by September 7th. And then consistent with prior practices, I believe the OECD will hold a public consultation on the draft, seeking additional feedback from the various interested parties Historically, the OECD has also welcomed um, one-off meetings, and so to the extent that this is a very important issue for some of our clients, we might want to work with them and get them in front of the OECD to express their particular views if they're not uh, captured by one of the comment letters. In that regard, I, I highly recommend that we're having conversations with their clients about any gaps between their current policies and the draft guidance. At a minimum, we should be helping our clients to understand what the risk is with respect to their divergent positions from the guidance. And depending on the client's risk appetite, assist them in revising the client's policies, positions, practices, et cetera. I think that there will be some movement in the position that the OECD takes on the various items. Certainly, there are a number of places where they specifically requested information. Um, they, they need to be educated on some of these issues. And so, again, I, I think there might be some movement in the positions taken, but I would be very surprised to see a material paradigm shift at this point. And, you know, the guidance is sorely needed from a, just a controversy uh, risk management perspective. And so hopefully by next uh, summer we'll see the final rule. Thanks, Catherine, for your insights. Omar, for your views from a European um point of view and, and a Dutch point of view in particular, and, and then thanks for your comments and, and your views from a, from a UK perspective as well. Great. Thank you, Vout, Catherine, Omar, and Dan, and thank you to everyone who listened to this podcast. If you would like more information about this topic, please email the participants. Their email addresses can be found in the description of this episode. Thank you.